Characteristics of True and False Prophets, Teachers and Priests Summary of Statements from the Lord Spoken by Pascal Great and extraordinary things will be falsified. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 235, Verses 1 to 6. Said Lazarus, But Lord, one cannot believe and assume that this your teaching will ever become falsified, since, as we have received it from you, we will pass it on to our descendants, and nothing will be added. Nothing will be taken away. We can also write and record word for word what we have heard and seen from you. And all our descendants will hear all this from point to point and act accordingly. So I do not understand how the rise of false prophets could be even possible. Said I, Just like you speak now, the major followers of Moses have spoken as well when I gave them the laws on Sinai. The legislation, as you will know, lasted for seven full years and a little more time, and afterwards continued in secret for another thirty-three years, yet not apparent for everyone. And already during the first seven years, the golden calf was poured and worshipped. Behold, this is how the people are. that my teaching will be kept pure with you and a few of your descendants for quite a long period of time, I admit. But in general, it will look quite differently. Wherever something great and extraordinary happens, it is exploited by idle individuals and their sense for rapacity, transformed into their material source of income something that is as true as the truth itself. To prevent such machinations, I would merely need to allow angels of death to descend into this world, who would kill all those people in advance. This, however, according to the free will of man, would not be appropriate, just as it is not appropriate to destroy all the weed on a wheat field with a single blow, as that would be detrimental to the wheat field as a whole because in the end, the weed will become a fertilizer for the field. Just as the weed is allowed on the wheat field, this rapacious behavior will be allowed as well. However, not without consequences, a punishment following sooner or later. Behold, it cannot be prevented entirely. Therefore, I merely say this, that all those who now possess the pure teaching from me, and later from you, my disciples, must always be on guard to not fall into temptation. The evil spirit travels the world like a roaring and hungry lion, seeking to devour all noble and pure spirits. And so, beware of false prophets. That is all I can say and do for you against this threat. The first false prophet in Christianity. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 235, Verses 7 to 15. Asked Peter, Lord, if they were to somehow appear during our time already, how will we recognize them? Said I, By their fruit. On thorny hedges, no figs will ripen, and on thistles, no grapes will mature. I, with my teaching, am the only door to the sheepfold. He who breaks into the stable from anywhere else is a thief and a robber. I am the only proper door, the way, the light, the truth and the life. He who wishes to come to me must go through me and in me, walking my ways, in my light, the everlasting, unchangeable truth in God. Every proper worker is worth his remuneration. The hireling, however, who allows himself to be hired to do someone else's work, 
is seldom worth the hireling's wage. He merely pretends to work for the sake of the hireling's wage, but the employer is served poorly thereby. Thus, and even worse, shall be all false teachers and prophets. Their motive, like with the Pharisees now, will be mammon. For its sake, they will teach and prophesy idiotic and erroneous things, deceive the people physically and even more so spiritually, devour the goods of the widows and orphans, and in return will assure them of heaven, finally pursuing those remaining loyal to the truth as the greatest heretics with sword and flame, and ostentatiously exclaiming, We are the true followers of Christ, the Son of God. I tell you this in advance, so that you and your true followers will know how to act when these things come about, and already occurred partially. Said Peter, Lord, how could this possibly have already happened? Said I, Quite easily. How many times already have I taught before a large crowd, and there were not only those among them who accepted the matter for the salvation of their soul, but also those who embraced it for the salvation of their money bag. Some of the things they experienced themselves, some they were told by others, and most of it they made up, thus heaping lies upon lies, undertaking journeys to all regions, presenting themselves as my envoys, and making quite a profit thereby. What do you say to that? Said Peter and John, Lord, do you no longer have lightning and thunderbolts in store for such sinners? Said I, Well now, are you children of thunder or the children of God? Lightning yields destruction wherever it strikes, but the children of God have other weapons at their disposal, and they are called patience, gentleness, and love. Nonetheless, these people are still of the opinion that, by their actions, they render unto God an agreeable service. You will meet with such individuals on many an occasion, and many will convert. Yet, if we were to destroy them with lightning from the clouds above, would you still be able to convert them? So, do not resort to lightning strikes immediately. The truth itself is the very best lightning against such false teachers and prophets. It would be more likely for you to dry up all the seas of the world than to damn the stream of truth. With me, you will be able to achieve anything. However, without me, nobody is capable of doing anything. For I am the truth, the light and the life. Do you understand this? Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 76, Verse 19 Truly, those who seek me not where I am, they do not find me, and never will. In time, many will look for me, and they will not find me. There will come a time when many false prophets and messiahs will rise up and tell you, Behold, here is the Anointed, or there he is. However, do not believe any of them, for where they say I could be found, exactly there I will be found the very least, and never will be. Those who will seek me wherever it reeks of the world, even in the slightest, will not find me. For only he who seeks me in true love, humility, and self-abnegation will surely find me, always and everywhere. The Awakening of True Prophets in Silence Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 5, Chapter 83, Verses 12 and 13 The Lord will always awaken the prophets of truth in complete silence, and they will never make noise or any perceptible sound in the world, like still water. And within those who make noise and the sound, the truth and the word of the Spirit will not be. The true prophets awakened by God 
will be in a position to perform miracles in complete silence. Yet the world will not take notice of it. Only the true friends of God will, for their own quiet comfort alone. Modesty, Humility and Selflessness Jacob Lorber, The Earth, Chapter 70, Verses 29 and 30 Whosoever exclaims, I say it, and this is my work, do not believe him. And if anyone speaks as if he were speaking in the name of the Lord, but is really doing so for but his own honor and advantage, do not believe him either. Yet he who speaks without self-interest, not seeking his own honor, the Lord says it, do believe him. In particular, if no heed is paid to the person's reputation. For the reborn one knows only the reputation of the Lord. But all men are his brothers. Distinguishing Characteristics Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 3, Chapter 204, Verses 10 to 16. But how can one nevertheless tell a false prophet from a genuine one apart? Quite easily, by their fruits. For one cannot gather grapes and figs from thorns and thistles. The true prophet will never be selfish, and arrogance will be foreign to him. These things are an impossibility for him. He might surely and gratefully accept whatever some good and noble hearts will gift him, but he will never demand fees of anyone, for he knows that this is an abomination to God, and because God knows very well how to keep and sustain his servants. But the false prophet will allow himself to be paid for every step and deed, and for every so-called divine act, for the feigned good of humanity. The false prophet will thunder on about the judgment of God, even judging in the name of God, with sword and flame. The true prophet, however, will judge no one, merely advising the sinner to repent, casting no divide between big and small, between the respected and the undistinguished. For to him, God is everything, as well as his word. Everything else is but a vain madness to him. There will never be a contradiction in the speech of the true prophet. Conversely, cast the speech of a false prophet into the light, and it will be crawling with contradictions. No one could ever offend the true prophet. He will bear it all like a lamb, no matter what the world might do to him. Only against lies and arrogance will he rise up in ardent fervor to beat them down. The false prophet is, at all times, a mortal enemy of every truth, of every true progress in thought and deed. No one but he can know anything or have any experience, so that all are continuously compelled to seek advice from him in regards to any and all matters, in exchange for monetary compensation. The false prophet thinks only of himself. God and his order are an annoyance and a laughing stock to him, things in which he has not even the smallest spark of faith. For this very reason, he may create a god out of wood and stone with a clear conscience in whatever way he pleases. That such a God may then easily work wonders for the thoroughly blinded humanity through the hands of the false prophet is easily understood. The Goal of Seal Jesus Christ, Jacob Lorber, Heavenly Gifts Volume 2, Chapter 112, Verses 1 to 12 speaks Jesus. If you go through that which was said here even remotely attentively and consider the answer that was given by the greatest of all prophets of Israel 
Elijah. Then it cannot slip by you, whereby a true prophet is clearly distinguished from a false one, who at all times is a servant of Baal and a blind Pharisee in the truest sense of the word. However, so that you and everyone else shall know exactly how things are between a true and a false prophet, I merely wish to bring the following to your attention, excerpts from the statements of the prophet Elijah. And so, listen. For whom alone did the true prophet Elijah strive? Did he strive for worldly rights, power and income, consisting of gold and silver? He says, I was ardent for the Lord of hosts. You see, should someone strive without compensation for the only true God, doing so as the prophet Elijah had done, tell me, could that be a false prophet? So, seal is the most secure and infallible sign for discerning true prophets from false ones. However, if one were to strive for the worldly esteem of his church and its leader, buried in gold, silver, and all manner of precious stones, and another strives for me alone, which of these two prophets is evidently the only true one? I mean, to answer that, no one would need to consult mathematics. However, since Elijah was a wholly true prophet, how did he recognize me when I passed over the entrance of the cave on Mount Horeb, even though he laid hidden within the cave? Did he recognize me in the great and mighty wind? Behold, I do not dwell within those either, they who bring about wind and spectacle, for that is the way of the true and blindest Pharisees. Or did Elijah recognize me in the fire that followed? Behold, in the same way do I not dwell within the fiery zealots either, whose mouths spray one judgment and condemnation after another, for they wish to recognize God in the fire of judgment alone, but never in love. No, the true prophet Elijah had recognized me within the quiet and peaceful breeze or whisper alone. In other words, meaning, Elijah had only truly recognized me in love alone. When you, Jacob Lorber, also recognize me in the gentle breeze of love alone, in the same way as Elijah did, how are you then a false prophet? Therefore, let the worldly prophets speak and rise against us. In the end, it will be blatantly evident who will guide the bride home. In the love, Elijah was called to be a judge over Israel, hence why he had to travel to Damascus and anoint Hazael and Jehu as kings and Elisha as a prophet, so they might preserve those who had not yet bowed down before Baal separating the chaff of Baal from my pure wheat with the sword of faithfulness. What has happened there as a strong example? Behold, this now happens in the spirit as well. And so, in the end, the love will be victorious over everything, and it shall destroy and put to shame all the winds, earthquakes, and all the fire. Now, judge for yourself and spot the true prophet amidst the great crowd of false ones, the servants of the world. Elijah is a true prophet, yet so are all who find me as Elijah did, in the love. Lust for power, an indicator of false prophets. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 9, Chapter 185, Verses 7 to 9. He who wishes to effortlessly distinguish a false prophet from a true prophet and teacher called by me must take a look at their works. 
Some things man simply cannot hide from the gaze of his fellow men, namely his selfishness and lust for profit. To satisfy these, all too soon he shall leave nothing unattempted to reach the goal for which his heart holds such an indestructible love. Therefore, let the false prophets never receive might or reputation, for once they have attained these things, soon will darkness fall among the people, and it will be a hard-fought battle against them. Selflessness and Service to God Jacob Lorber, The Childhood and Youth of Jesus Chapter 228, verses 11 to 15 Jesus speaks Indeed, that is how we can, at all times, accurately distinguish the true servants of God from the false. The true servants are selfless to a high degree, and the false ones are exactly the opposite. For the true servants serve God in their hearts, receiving the supreme and eternal reward. The false servants, however, serve a God modeled after their own wicked nature for the sake of the world. And so they also seek the reward of the world, seeing to it that they are compensated excessively at every turn. Appointing oneself pseudo-humility and spirituality. Jacob Lorber, Paul's letter to Laodicea, chapter 2, verses 9 to 14. I ask you, imploring you even, do not allow anyone to decide for you what your goal should be, especially by one who, by his own initiative, wanders around in all apparent humility and complete spirituality of the angels of heaven, but has never seen nor heard any of these things himself. Because of this, he is conceited, convinced of his own importance, but merely in his carnal sense. He does not abide by the head, whence all the vigor animating the entire body originates, by which they would maintain and contain each other, growing to divine greatness. Instead, he clings only to his own will, itself brimming with dirt, filth, self-interest, deceit, lies, lust for power, avarice, and envy. This is the state of him who merely poses as one called upon by the Lord and me, and elected by you thereafter. I now point out to all of you one such as this carries the spirit of the devil within him, walking among you like a wolf in sheep's clothing, a hungry, roaring lion endeavoring diligently to devour you. And so, drive him away post-haste. Self-imposed purity and dietary laws. Jacob Lorber, Paul's letter to Laodicea, chapter 2, Verses 19 to 30. And do not give heed to those who say with a hypocritically pious expression, Do not touch that, and do not eat this, and do not hold on to that, and do not do this or that. All these are nothing more than empty man made laws. Do give heed, however to what I have to say out of the Spirit of Christ, which is within me, so that you may become free once again to be truthful co-heirs of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God, alive within you. O oh, brothers, of what use to you will be those who merely appear to possess wisdom, as well as self-chosen, hypocritical, and feigned spirituality and humility, They say to you, when you merely gaze at a woman, you have sinned already, and should you eat impure food forbidden by Moses, then you are unclean for an entire day. And when you touch a heathen, speaking more than three words to him, then you must tell the priest of the temple, 
so that he may cleanse you before God. In reality, they are full of filth, avarice, and harlotry, continuing to do business with all the heathens in secret, and doing everything in their power to not have their hidden friendship with them spoiled. But I say, the body requires what is his, just like the spirit, for he has his want and need. This is why you must give to him in proper measure whatever God has intended for him, and he must be content with what is available. The physical body requires care, just as the spirit requires his freedom. Therefore, be free, and be not slaves to the fools of this world. However, what laudable things could one say of himself even when he fasted in his stomach, yet filled his heart with wicked thoughts, wishes, and desires? Would it not be all the wiser to fast in the heart than in the stomach? How could you be such great fools that you would allow someone else to make you believe it would be more pleasing to the Lord if you were to eat fish marinated in oil than to eat another meat from a warm-blooded animal with the fat thereof instead of the oil. But I say to you, eat within reason at all times, whatever suits your palate, and eat whatever is good for the health of your body, and drink wine with water, even as I do, whenever it is available. And do not let your conscience trouble you, for then you will do the right thing, even in this instance. For the Lord does not delight in the fasting of the stomach. He does, however, favor the fasting of the heart. In the heart, fast day and night, for then you will fast in spirit and truth. But as you wish to fast now, in accordance with the hypocritical teachings of those who pretend to stand on the earth with but one foot, while everything else is in heaven already, so do all the heathens fast as well. On their feast days they partake of all manner of delicacies, being all the more lustful for them then than on the common days, when they have their daily bread. But now that you are risen with Christ, why do you heed the happenings below, and why do you seek to satisfy the statutes of the world, which are the work of men? Characteristics of false prophets in ecclesiastical disguise Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 22, Verse 6 Jesus speaks. The signs by which you will easily recognize them are empty boasting, great and crude presumption of divine powers, which they never had and will never have in this world, great magnificence, great splendor, mystical pomp as among the Gentiles, and the greatest possible thirst for power, a never satisfied greed for the greatest treasures and goods of this world. Hopefully, they will not be too difficult to recognize from these very palpable characteristics. Selfish vocational motives, seminary education, and ceremonial consecration. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 150, Verses 24 and 25. Jesus Speaks Countless of these false followers will take your office, by compulsion or by the prospect of finding a good and carefree life in your position. However, all these will be counted by me to the regiment of the Antichrist, and their works will give rise to a vile stench, appearing as a stinking cadaver before God. Truly, I say to you, all your successors who are not prepared by me but trained only by the people of certain schools of the world to follow your office. 
those I shall not gaze upon. For only the Antichrist will qualify his disciples in this manner. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 179, Verse 3. Indeed, take great care to only receive that which you require to live from those who accept the gospel. For should the idlers realize that the preaching and signs provide you with a lot of money, then they will do everything in their power to oust you. And so, at the earliest, you will recognize the false prophets by their works. For the real prophets always walk in my poverty, only accepting from their congregations the basic life requirements. The false prophets, however, will do as the Pharisees are doing now, and in many cases, a lot worse even. For every service they render in my name to the congregations, they will insist on being greatly compensated monetarily. The people will regard them as servants of God, and by punishment they must believe that God heeds their prayers alone, gazing upon only their sacrifices with great pleasure. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 8, Chapter 14, Verses 2 and 4 to 10. Yes, I know and see how a great multitude of false teachers will arise after me, saying to the people, Behold, here is Christ, or there he is. But I say to all of you now, even to your fellow men and children, none must believe such false teachers, for they shall easily be recognized by their works. And so, whenever you meet teachers who spread the coming of the kingdom of God among the people in this manner, according to my will, then you and everyone else shall consider them genuine, holy, true teachers. However, when teachers seek to make business with my teaching, even then in my name, for the purpose of obtaining money and other treasures, then consider them false, for they were never called by me to be propagators of my teaching. My true disciples and propagators of my pure teaching will always be poor in all earthly matters, just like me. And yet because of this, they will be all the richer from a spiritual point of view. They have no need of acquiring my teaching and word through the time-consuming consultation with a predecessor. Instead, I will lay my teaching and will directly into their hearts and mouths. However, the false ones, by the long study of their equally false doctrines, will acquire and adopt all manner of texts, words, and proverbs. And only after having tediously mastered all this will they, by their boastful teachers and leaders, be ordained as disciples by all manner of empty and blind ceremonies. This is exactly what happens now in the temple with the Pharisees, scribes and elders, and even with you Gentiles where the rank of priest is forming a real social class in and of itself, continuing from father to son, and into which one from among the common people is only accepted when one or the other priest happens to have no children. And even then, the newcomer must still be a child that must first be educated as a priest. So, how a true teacher and propagator of my pure teaching may be distinguished from a false one, this I have now clearly explained to all of you. Thus will everyone know to beware the false teachers and prophets. However, he who will nonetheless follow and believe them, honor them and even assist them in their machinations, he can only blame himself when he will be devoured by them down the line. Yes, it will even come to pass that the false prophets will exalt themselves upon golden thrones, seeking to persecute those that were chosen and called by me. However, when this happens, then their own judgment and end will come upon them, 
And despite that, my teaching will continue to exist among the people of the earth. However, only in quietude will it shine and radiate, bringing comfort to the people as a free possession, but never as a ruler, commanding entire nations with throne, crown, staff, and scepter. Where this will be the case in my name, I shall be far from there, and instead of my love will greed, avarice, envy, and persecution of all kinds dwell among the people and one deceit will beget another. Once you spy such fruits among the people, then surely will you perceive what spirit truly dwells within those prophets who rule upon thrones, and from whom their false teachings originate. If you could have what is right and true at all times, provided that you have a desire for it, then surely you will not turn your heart to that which is false. And so, now you know that despite all the false prophets and teachers who will arise later on, my pure teaching will continue to persist among the people in quietude, without pompous display, until the end of times. The fact that this teaching of mine will only spread slowly among the people of the earth, the reasons for this I have already clearly shown you more than once. For I surely know best when a people is ready to accept my teaching. The Imperiousness and Arrogance of False Prophets Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 9, Chapter 166, Verses 9 and 10 there will come a time when false, imperious prophets will do in my name the very same thing as do now the Pharisees and their followers, and they will honor me in the eyes of the people with all manner of ceremonies, and even with gold, silver, and precious stones. However, through the mouth of those awakened by my spirit, I will say to them, Behold this miserable lot that honors me the Lord of life, with the filth, death, and judgment of matter. But their heart is far from me. That is why I too will be far from such people. And so, in future, you shall not build any temples or altars to me. For never will I live in temples erected by human hands, and I will not allow myself to be honored upon altars. He who loves me and will keep my simple commandments is my living temple, and his heart, full of love and patience, is the true and living sacrificial altar to my honor, the only thing that is pleasing to me. The rest is judgment, death, and ruin. Persecution of the True Followers of Jesus Jacob Lorber Great Gospel of John, Volume 9, Chapter 40, Verse 1 Jesus speaks, During that time, true faith and pure love will be extinguished entirely. In their place, a faith of delusion will be imposed upon the people, enforced with most severe criminal laws, just as a malicious fever would force death upon the human body. And should one or the other congregation, strengthened by my spirit, rise up against the false teachers and prophets, those possessing an abundance of gold, silver, precious stones, as well as other great earthly goods, who, haughty, imperious, and selfish as they are, will present themselves to the people as your only true successors and my representatives, in order to be honored above all, and if that congregation will show them that they are exactly the opposite of how they present themselves to the people, with the most insolent and God-forsaken impertinence, by forcing them to search for the salvation of their souls and the truth with themselves, then there will come battles, wars, and persecutions, such as have not yet taken place since the very beginning of men on this earth. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, 
Volume 6, Chapter 235, Verse 9. The false teachers and prophets will pursue those remaining loyal to the truth with sword and fire, branding them as the greatest heretics and saying with great pomp, We are the true followers of Christ, the Son of God. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 7, Chapter 184, Verse 6 The Secondary Son which rose more to the north at almost the same time as the true sun, representing myself in this likeness, denotes the counter-prophet, or counter-anointed, who will arise and say, Behold, I am the true anointed of God. Hear me if you wish to be blessed. But I tell you that none of you must allow yourselves to be tempted, for he is a messenger of hell, and by his deceitful arts he will perform all manner of wondrous signs, showing you a pious face, praying and making sacrifices. But his heart is brimming with bitter hatred against all truth, which he will persecute by fire and sword, and all who will not keep his teaching he will curse. He will also invent the three gods and have them be worshipped. I will be counted among them as the savior of the world though divided into three individual persons. Still they will confess one God with their mouth, yet worship three persons, all of whom will be complete gods unto themselves, which must be worshipped separately. Pomp churches, ceremonies, magical elements in worship, praying in foreign languages. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 8, Chapter 39, verse 14. Jesus speaks. You must not confuse the paganism of the end times, of which I was speaking, with the paganism of this current time. The temples of idolatry of the present will indeed have been destroyed a long time ago, but instead of them, numerous others will be built by the Antichrist, and this even in my name. Their priests will have themselves be exceedingly honored as my representatives on earth, and they will go to great effort to gather all the treasures of the world. They will gorge themselves, and the people will be in great need in both spirit and body. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 6, Chapter 179, Verses 3 and 4. For all the Jews, there stands but this single temple. Yet the counter-Christians will erect countless other temples with great splendor, and therein they will perform magic and sacrifices, delivering wicked and selfish speeches before the people. They will pray in foreign languages, Latin, to make the people believe that this their speech is the purest of them all, and therefore most pleasing to God. This shall suffice for all to recognize a false prophet and to distinguish him from a true one. Of course, they will make a fuss and shout to all the world, You all come to us, for Christ is here and he is where we are. However, do not believe them, irrespective of all their shouting and continued performance of ever greater signs. For they were never my disciples. Instead, being deceived followers of Beelzebub, from whom they shall receive their just reward within the murky pool, with howling and gnashing of teeth. Recommendations of Jesus Against Unjust Clerical Practices Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 10, Chapter 28, Verse 9 just let the clergy exploit the people. Let the still blind people make pilgrimages and pay expensive masses. Let them do their confessions, go to church, organize expensive and exaggerated processions for their deceased ones. Let the clergy chase inheritances and sell expensive exemptions and remissions of sin. Let those Babylonians do worse things still, for then 
even the most blind will soon come to their senses, saying, No, such religion can only be the barest deceit. For those who should be most convinced of the pure teaching of Christ, who should act accordingly, show by their deeds that they themselves attach no importance to his instructions. They do not believe in a God, and thus they simply are false prophets. All they care about are their bellies. On many occasions they rob the people of all their possessions by all manner of deceit. And if this does not suffice, they make use of lawful coercion made legal to them by the state. Not even to a single thirsty soul will they grant a sip of all the things they simply took away. And so, away with all those false prophets. Away with those devouring wolves in sheep's clothing. And away with everything with which they tormented, deceived and robbed the poor blind people. Away with the temples, altars, sacred images, relics, bells and all other useless clerical utensils that do not possess any spiritual value for life. From now on, we shall examine the entirety of Christ's teaching ourselves, and have the true teachers, enlightened by God himself, explain them to us. Thereafter, we shall live and act accordingly, and the true teacher will not grow hungry or thirsty at our table and he shall not accompany us on bare and naked feet. Jacob Lorber, Great Gospel of John, Volume 8, Chapter 186, Verse 1 Jesus speaks. Even a few hundred years prior to Christ's arrival, I shall awaken ever more enlightened seers, prophets and servants, who will, in my name, and just as clear and truthful, teach the peoples everywhere about everything, and thus freeing them from all manner of lies and deceit. They will clear the way for the downfall of the false prophets and priests, even in my name.